Hey guys, this is Scott. Welcome to part, uh, let's see, what part is this? Part four, I think, of the Admiral. And hopefully this will be the last part, um, as what I'm doing now is restuffing, where I left off last time was restuffing electrolytics, and that's, that's, that is what I'm working on right now. But one thing I wanted to do, because there's been a lot of comments regarding these guys right here, these Mallory plastic caps, um, which we have deemed um, yellow jackets, okay? Because you, it's basically the same thing as this guy right here, which we affectionately call bumblebees. Uh, some people call them black beauties. Others call them black bombs because they they do have a tendency to explode or they can explode. And um, so I've cut one of the uh, bumblebees open and you can see, you know, it, it's, it's a lot like um, a normal paper cap. It's got uh, electrical foil or foil wrapped around uh, into a core here. And that's what's inside of it with this hard plastic case. Not a lot different than your typical wax cap, but yet construction wise it is, is considerably different. And of course back in the 50s this was um, new and improved and um, supposed to be a better way to go than the old wax caps. But as we know now <clears throat> in 2015 working on vintage electronics we know that the lifespan of these really wasn't even as good as uh, some of your RO wax caps. I have ran into a lot of vintage electronics that is full of original wax caps and they will certainly operate better in some cases operate better than anything that's full of these. In fact most things that I run into that are full of these won't work at all. So um, even though these are kind of grizzly looking um, and maybe melted all up, they still can work. As to where these, you never know if they're working or not until you properly test them. And my experience has been 95% of the time, they're no good. Same goes for these. Um, I, I got my tester out and did some tests. They test similar to, to bumblebees. They're, they're just not good. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting to bust one of these open, which I did, just to see what, what was inside. And it's very similar to what you'd find inside of a bumblebee. So it's just simply a, a roll of plastic or thin, um, I guess it's a plastic type material lined with this electric uh, or foil type material and you know you can just keep unrolling it and unrolling it and that's that's what's inside so basically the same thing as this and uh, has the same issues and same performance problems today so, you know, I guess the point is bumblebee is bad, yellow jacket just as bad. So if you run into these yellow jackets, it's, it's the same thing as running into a bumblebee. They'll both sting you. Okay. So the other thing was, I know I said I wasn't going to do this, but I got to thinking that some of my subscribers may have never seen how I restuff an electrolytic can. Just thought I'd show you real quick how I do it. Uh, there's there's a few different ways you can do it, but I start out by making a mark on the outside of the can, outside the circumference of the can. I come in with a fine bladed uh, hacksaw and very carefully cut it open. I mark where I, I put that mark there so that I I know how the cap goes back on for best fit and clean out all the insides of the electrolytic can which is usually got a big piece of tar in there 
have to heat it up with a heat gun. Sometimes you have to use a corkscrew to pull it out. Sometimes it'll pull out on its own. Then I usually end up cleaning the inside of the can out, cleaning this area up. Then I come back and drill some holes for the leads to the new capacitors. Get them soldered in and get them mounted and then come back with hot glue in here and you can see these caps are in there pretty firm. So then the next step would be to come back, line the can up and put on some aluminum tape. And once the cap's back together, you can hardly tell that, that anything's been done to it. So there's, there's several different ways that you can open these cans. I've seen people use pipe cutters um, to do it. I, I have tried with my pipe cutter before, but this is so soft that I've had problems um, with really bending in um, the material here. The other thing people can do or have done, I've seen done, and I haven't had that much success, but you can uncrimp around, uh, all the way around, and this actual piece, this, this, this piece where the connections are will uh, come right out. Um, it's just all a matter of preference. I found this, for me, is the quickest and easiest way uh, to get the task accomplished. And it looks, it looks pretty good when you're done. And if you've never seen what's inside of a, a can capacitor, well, this is what you're going to find. This was rolled up into a nice tight ball. And it's very simply a very thin metal material. I'm not even sure what this is. It's interlaced with paper, and then um, there's there's pieces of foil inside of, of layers of paper, and then this was actually a contact point uh, that went to the bottom of the can, and there's three of these in this particular unit for three different different sections of capacitance that that we needed. And what's interesting to note about this one is, if you recall in the last video, this capacitor tested pretty well. And it is still nice and moist. It has that, it's a very unique smell that comes out of these. Um, and when you can smell that smell uh, really well, I, mean, I don't know if you can tell on the camera or not, but this is still really moist. And when you have that kind of a smell, you've got a lot of your, uh, your moisture still in here. You can see it's hard for this to pull apart because it's still moist. So it's no wonder this cap was, was still working right. Um, but the set will be better off in the long term with these brand new electrolytics in it. These will last for 20 to 25 years. So it'll be a while before somebody has to deal with this again. And with this, you never know when it's going to go. So... Anyway, just a little look at capacitors. Okay, got all of the electrolytic caps replaced and um, a couple of more resistors. There's a new 8200 ohm resistor right there that I found out of tolerance and that is in, um, that is in the horizontal oscillator circuit. And another bad cap right or resistor replaced here. And then I went ahead and left that 10 microfarad 450 volt cap out of that can. That can's been restuffed. And then this last can here has been restuffed. So all the electrolytics are changed. Right now I'm just letting the set play to make sure everything's buttoned up under the chassis before um, I put the cover back on. There's a, there's a cover, a plate that goes over this chassis, but it um, seems to be um, playing just fine. Great sound. And let's see here. Turn some lights out demonstrate the picture. We'll get a final look at it, but um, you can see here 
really good picture. There's contrast, brightness, plenty of brightness. Just a nice plain set. So I think it's going to be okay. So I'll get it. I'll get it up on the bench, and uh, we'll get a final look at it. Okay, here it is, back upright. We'll get a little better look at it now. You can see, uh, getting a pretty good picture. So, as far as replacement of parts, I think we're about done here. In fact, we are done. Just need to do a uh, couple of quick looks at some adjustments for the owner when he gets this back and what he'll need to do to mate this back up with his picture tube. And, then get it in this cabinet and start enjoying it um, watching the TV so it's uh, performing very well should should provide uh, a lot of good hours of fun viewing great looking set Okay, here we go. The chassis is getting prepared to go back home. As uh, you've seen with the picture that I have, I don't think there's much more I can do for this set with just using the test CRT. I did put the NTSC generator on it and looked at the linearity. It's not bad, um, but then again, that CRT doesn't use the focus coil. And as far as centering and all that, uh, the only way to really get that right is to use the original CRT. So these are mainly notes here at the end uh, for the owner. Uh, when you get the set back, you know, you'll want to put your CRT in. Um, slide it carefully through uh, back in the way you, you slid it out. Make sure you secu secure it back to the chassis the way it, it's supposed to be secured. And then just a couple of notes, um, this CRT connector is very delicate, so if you do need to remove it, make sure that you use, you grab a hold of the inside when pulling it off, don't grab a hold from the outside. And just keep in mind that these contacts are, are very old. They're like any other tube socket. They've got some wear on them. They're not as tight as they used to be. I tried to tighten them up a little bit. And um, you could get intermittent contact on this. So sometimes if you just wiggle it a little bit, it'll, it'll be fine. The other thing is, is this focus coil is adjustable. And it's designed to go around this picture tube neck. Um, and I tried to put it back on. The way that I found it, it could be slightly off, and the way it is adjusted is loosening these bolts. And I'm sending home some instructions, okay, that, that talks to um, adjusting the, um, the uh, focus coil, as well as the ion trap magnet, which hopefully i know you had to take it off to take the crt out but we do have pictures of it and uh when the when you get the crt back or when you get ready to fire it up you're going to have to adjust that that ion trap magnet uh, for the brightest picture that you can get so uh, the good news is i think bob anderson did a, a restoration series on this exact set and i know that he dealt with um, centering this picture and moving this picture around and using the ion trap magnet uh, on this very set so we can always refer back to that but uh, you will not get a raster or anything without that ion trap magnet and we can refer back to the video you did on this set on YouTube and you you should be able to see exactly how that ion trap magnet was placed okay now the other thing that once you do get the set up and playing um, 
you know, outside of your normal user controls, which is your on and off, contrast, this is brightness, this is vertical hold, horizontal hold, and then this is focus, and this is, this is directly attached to that focus magnet. There are also other user controls back here that you'll need to definitely um, work on. And this is uh, vertical linearity. You can see it's a user control. You can simply touch it and move it around. And this is the height control. This is the horizontal drive. You can see there it's just a screw inside there. I don't think you'll need to touch that, so do not touch that. Um, the other is, is there's horizontal linearity and there's vertical linearity. And it looks like, I'm sorry, that's width. Horizontal linearity and width. And it may look like there's nothing there, but actually there is. You're not going to be able to see it, but there's some lugs in there that have a very small screwdriver indentation to them. And you have to stick your a screwdriver, a small one like this, in there. And um, what I did was I used a flashlight to peek up in there because you can't see. And you stick your screwdriver in there. And then you can either use a mirror to watch the screen or have somebody help you. But this is the way you adjust your width and your horizontal linearity. So when you get it back, you're going to have to do, obviously, some, some fine-tuning adjustments. Um, because it has been messed with since, since you pulled your CRT. So Anyway, I think it's ready to go. And... Um, I'll be boxing up the chassis and the tubes today and this set will be on its way home and hopefully maybe we can get a look at it after it's operating and in its cabinet. But this is going to conclude the restoration of the, of the, uh, Admiral chassis, 21 B1 chassis. Okay, thanks for watching guys.